Um, this webinar has both A4S Academy and non-academy participants and you are all very welcome. So before we begin, I would just like to run through the ground rules for a productive virtual session. I think everyone is now pretty uh, well aware of these, but um, as usual, please stay as engaged as possible. And we have a lot to cover in an hour, so please keep any contributions relevant to help us stay on time. Uh, finally, we do, um, or you can ask any questions freely in the chat function, which I'll show you in a second. And finally, we welcome any additional members of your household who want to learn, including pets and children. We know that everyone is working in unusual circumstances and some of these things are just beyond our control. Um, so this webinar um, fits into our uh, various pillars and it fits under transform your decisions, which is about integrating sustainability considerations into financial decision making. Now, the first place to start with this is strategic planning, budgeting and forecasting. You will hear about the guide and the various tools that A4S has developed to help finance teams integrate sustainability into these processes. Uh, so this is the agenda for the day. Um, so we have just some introductions and a quick tech tour. Um, an introduction to the A4S Essential Guide uh, will be provided by Elizabeth. And then we'll hear from uh, John Wright speaking about HSBC's approach to integrating sustainability into corporate strategy. Finally, we will hear from Steve Thompson and Rob Gray from National Grid regarding their carbon price um, and how to put that into budgeting. Um, so quickly, um, we have some learning objectives for the call. After completing today's course, participants will be able to articulate the business benefits of integrating sustainability into strategic planning, budgeting and forecasting. List the good practice examples of integrated strategic planning, budgeting and forecasting. And finally, translate the experience and learnings of others to your work. So to introduce you to the voices that you'll hear today, um, I'm joined by my colleagues, Helen and Elizabeth, who you will hear from shortly. And I would like to give very special thanks to John Wright from HSBC, Steve Thompson and Rob Gray from National Grid. So before we launch into the content, I'll just give a very quick overview of the features of Zoom that we'll be using today. As I said, please put any questions in the chat function. Uh, this can be found on the right hand side of your screen and you should see me writing hello in there now. I'll just do that. So yes, as I say, any questions in there. Um, we will be using a number of polls throughout the call. Um, these will help keep the webinar interactive and unnecessary for those who want to claim CPD or CPE points, as I said. In the interest of time, can I please ask that you be speedy with your answers? Um, let's test it quickly. So can you please let me know which department you are from? Finance, sustainability, strategy or other? Oh, everyone is very speedy. Fantastic. Great, thank you very much. I'm delighted to see that so many of you are from the finance team. So thank you for that. Um, and I will now hand over to Elizabeth for our first session. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, so I'll spend the next um, few minutes to introduce you to our essential guide to strategic planning, budgeting and forecasting. And as Lizzie mentioned earlier, it comes under the Transform Your Decisions pillar, which is about integrating uh, material sustainability factors into um, financial decision making. So why did we develop the guide? Um, well, we wanted to provide um, practical guidance and tools to finance teams uh, to integrate sustainability into the strategic planning, budgeting and forecasting processes. And the guide gives examples of um, current practices from members of our CFO leadership network and addresses the key challenges of adopting an integrated approach. And what do we mean by an integrated approach? Well, it means that decision making within an organization um, fully encompasses social and environmental impacts and dependencies. And that decision makers recognize that if they don't do this, um, they could potentially miss um, business opportunities and expose um, their organization to greater risks. Um, now, finance certainly has a key role to play in this, um, although other functions would need to get involved as well. 
but finance um, provides the core um, financial and analytical skills that are essential to um, building the business case for changing to a sustainable business model, for example. Um, and finance also has the experience and ability um, to provide the necessary information to the board and executive management for decision making. Uh, finance also has a clear understanding of risks and the value drivers um, of the organization, which is also very useful um, for developing an integrated approach. Um, so what are the key benefits of an integrated approach? Well, members of our CFO leadership network who were involved in developing the guide um, have said that um, it made clear business sense. Um, by considering the wider sustainability trends, um, not just the financial considerations, and understanding what are the risks and opportunities, then you can develop um, integrated strategies and responses. Uh, and having an integrated approach will also um, drive investment uh, to protect the long-term viability and success of your organization. It also means uh, aligning your uh, performance management with um, long-term value drivers, which can bring real benefits to your organization. It can also uh, reduce costs through um, operational efficiency, for example, through energy saving. Um, it can provide uh, brand benefits, uh, especially as um, societal expectations are increasing for companies to address environmental and social challenges. And last but not least, um, it can create a more balanced um, organization culture and lead to stronger employee and customer engagement. So now I will go through um, the structure of the guide, as you can see on the slide. Um, there are four main chapters covering process, governance, performance management, technology, and data. So under process, um, the guide really provides quite a lot of details on where and how sustainability should be considered and embedded in strategic planning, budgeting, and forecasting. So for example, when integrating sustainability into your corporate strategy, um, the key considerations include um, setting the context for strategic analysis by starting with looking at your corporate mission, vision, and values, um, using scenario analysis to inform how your business may need to evolve to meet the needs of the future, um, defining the key performance measure to monitor progress against strategic goals, and then considering uh, perhaps what are the criti critical success factors and enablers for achieving, uh, for achieving these goals. Um, of course, engaging across the business is also important, so you can um, bring in other colleagues together um, to drive um, strategic initiatives. Um, and later on, we have John from HSBC to talk more specifically about this area. Um, for budgeting, uh, traditionally it is um, financially focused, um, but there are various approaches to budget for um, sustainability factors. Um, for example, ring fencing is the simplest uh, approach. Um, capitals budgeting as well, uh, so setting a carbon budget or water budget is another way. Um, and shadow pricing as well, uh, which is um, about assigning a tangible value um, to an intangible item where it does not have um, a current defined market price, or maybe the current prices don't adequately factor in um, future risks or societal impacts. Now, this is um, increasingly being used by organizations for carbon emissions, um, however, um, it can also be used for other resources such as water. I'll just talk a little bit more about um, shadow pricing. Um, it supports risk management. So for example, if you have an internal cost on carbon, it provides a useful uh, risk mitigation to the future regulation of carbon. Um, shadow pricing is also adaptable to the level of simplicity or sophistication needed. So whether you simply incorporate the internal carbon price into um, a project or investment budget or use it to drive an internal carbon market within your organization. Um, it also provides an efficient way to achieve objectives and it can also drive cultural change. But also it is important to note that um, the choice of shadow price can be subjective and it's often calculated based on um, certain assumptions. So our guide talks about um, several recognized ways to price carbon. Um, so you might like to refer to it in your own time. Um, later on, we have speakers from National Grid who will talk about their internal carbon pricing. So we can hear an example of how it's done in practice as well. 
Um, so next chapter of the guide, we have governance, which uh, looks at organizational structure, management processes and external reporting uh, and risk management as well, and how all these can facilitate um, sustainability integration. The guide also has a chapter on um, performance management, which looks at both the performance of individual employees and the organizational performance, which builds on that and how an integrated approach can drive uh, long term value. Um, the last chapter then looks at the role of technology and data. So this is not just about having uh, robust systems in place, but also how to draw on um, external data and having access to the right data to feed into your um, strategic cycle and account for sustainability effectively. Um, so that's a quick overview of the guide. Um, please do look at it in your own time. Um, the link to the guide we will be sharing in the, in the resources email we will send to you after this webinar. Um, and as with all our essential guides, there's also a maturity map that helps you understand where your organization is um, in the different dimensions of uh, strategic planning, budgeting, and forecasting. And you can use it to think about um, setting ambitions and how to move forward um, to a leading position. So thank you for listening. Um, to end this session, I would just like to run a quick poll question, um, if we could bring it up. So what are the business benefits of integrating sustainability into strategic planning, budgeting, and forecasting? I mentioned these a little bit earlier on. So just give um, a minute for people to fill this in. Great. Yes, so in fact, all of these are benefits to your organization when you adopt an integrated approach. So thank you again. Uh, I will now pass to Helen for the next session. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so um, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I'm very keen to introduce um, our first guest, um, John Wright from HSBC. Um, as many of you uh, will know, HSBC is one of the largest banking and financial services organizations in the world. And they have assets of 2.7 trillion um, and operations in 64 countries and territories across the world. Um, their overarching strategy is to enable businesses to thrive and economies to prosper and ultimately helping people to fulfill their hopes um, and realize their ambitions. In delivering this strategy, HSBC is committed to supporting responsible economic growth and enabling the low carbon transition using sustainable finance. So we're pleased to have John Wright, who is the Sustainable Finance Reporting Manager, join us today to talk about HSBC's approach to setting strategic goals that incorporate sustainability and the internal engagement and performance management processes to support the achievement of those goals. Um, so I understand John is part of the finance team that reports to the chief accounting officer, but he also works closely with the strategy and sustainability functions on the strategic goals related to sustainable finance. Um, so welcome, John. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so if I could just have a quick reminder to everybody as I speak to John and ask him a few questions. Um, if you have any questions of your own, if you could please add them in the chat function as we go, and I will come back to them at the end. Um, so John, perhaps you can give us an overview first. You know, what's the process for setting the strategic priorities for the bank as a whole and, and how is sustainability being considered and integrated within that? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, I guess thinking about HSBC, we've got a 155 year history and the strategy has obviously evolved over that time. And, you know, our, our primary focus has always been to, to serve our clients. Um, and when I think of how it's evolved, probably over the last kind of decade per se, we've always for a long time had a internal corporate sustainability team. And the, I guess the focus there had been historically with on, within kind of the kind of philanthropic, the volunteering, the um, 
the charitable donations and that type of stuff, um, internal strategies around reducing in our own footprint. So that's been around for some time, but I guess there was a, a bit of a shift change a few years ago when we looked at trying to bring sustainability more into the forefront of the, the main strategy. Um, when we do look at our strategy as well, we do consider you know, the needs of our stakeholders. Um, we break some of those stakeholders down into uh, a number of areas. We look at customers, we look at communities, employees, investors, suppliers, governments and regulators and society as a whole. So we have a, a lot to consider. Um, and that strategy kind of developed to become, um, I guess, more in the mainstream from sustainability as, on, as a side to sustainability as part of the overarching strategy. Um, so um, a couple of years ago, back in 2018, we had a some strategic priorities that were announced as the group. Um, in order to get to that point, we had um, a lot of work with our strategy function who support the CEO. There was involvement with the corporate sustainability team, with the um, um, finance function as well, and to how we got to those um, key drivers. Um, it did help for us internally that uh, Daniel Clear, who was our head of strategy was also the head of corporate sustainability. So he was very keen at bringing those two areas into the mainstream. And for us as an organization, the big shift was actually looking at our customer bases and how we can help sustainable finance and really impact um, our clients, our loan book and help make a difference there. That's our biggest impact. Obviously the stuff we do in our own operations is key and you know, the volunteering and the donations are, very important, but actually how can help influence? And that's where sustainable finance, I guess, came into the mainstream for us in that strategy setting. Um, like I say, we've been supportive of all the government and global initiatives, be it um, the Paris Climate Agreement, um, new and sustainable development goals, and all the other things that have come off subsequently, we've always been there saying we would support um, where we can do. But like I say, back in 2018, with our eight strategic priorities, um, sustainability came into the forefront in actually two of those priorities. Um, in priority one, we included a, a number of areas of growth and development and included the uh, announcement that we'd made back in 2017, which was to provide $100 billion of sustainable financing and uh, investments um, by 2020. Uh, 20, sorry, by 2025. Um, so we, we put that in there as a key strategic priority. Um, the other one was around uh, more of a wider ESG metric and we decided to uh, aim to be an outperformer in a sustainalytics ESG rating um, to compare to our peers. So again, first time anything like that had ever really come into our strategic um, priorities. Um, so we kind of had that real focus. Um, that's not to say, we don't have a wider breadth. Um, obviously, within the bank, we've got um, our corporate sustainability team that have kind of more, I guess, three pillars that we look at. We've got um, sustainable supply chains, where we look at how we have that influence over the whole supply chain. We look at future skills, where we try and help um, people be more employable, understand about money and financing and set them up for the future. And the main bit, which is where I end up supporting and spend a lot of my time is around that sustainable finance um, strategy. Um, I look after the reporting of 100 billion and how we kind of look at that moving forward. Um, we How we've run and set up the data dictionary that supports that and underpins all of that um, and how we've kind of then been able to deliver, monitor and report on that moving forward. Um, like I say, there are, there are other areas of our strategy which we've kind of cover in our ESG um, updates every year. We've committed to become 100% powered by renewable by 2030 across all of our operations. Um, we've looked to ex reduce our exposure to thermal coal. We've been fully supportive of the TCFD, so the Task Force on uh, Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Um, we've been um, active in that and supportive from the start. So we've done two or three, uh, three years uh, worth of disclosures now. And we've also committed to being a, a, a lead, playing a leadership role in the financial industry within thought leadership and developing um, sustainable finance and kind of broader thinking around that space as we have to develop into scenario planning, stress testings for um, the banks now on, uh, on climate and climate risk. So a, a very broad breadth, but uh, again, sustainability and particularly sustainable finance has really hit the mainstream and is a, is a key part of our stress strategy moving forward.
Great, thank you. So it sounds like a good tip is to make your head of corporate sustainability to be your head of strategy. Sounds like that works quite well. I think that helped a lot, yeah. <laughs> but also he had the, you know, the senior buy-in from the board as well. You know, the CEO and the board were fully supportive um, and really understood this was a, a direction of travel we needed to take. Yeah, absolutely. So with that strategic priority being sustainable finance, maybe you can help us understand the process a little bit about you know, how you convert that into short and long-term targets that are relevant across the whole organization with it being such a large and complex organization. And, and, and maybe a little bit about, you know, what role finance play within that. Yeah, no, and it, it is a challenge. I mean, like I say, a financial institution and one like ours across all those territories is very broad and very different. Um, and particularly we have challenges around, you know, Europe's a lot more um, advanced in some of this area than maybe parts of Asia and the developing world that we operate and against different views across the, the US and the like. So um, it is a challenge. I think if I look back at how the, the process worked, um, part of it was it started off, I think, with that long term ambition. So the hundred billion dollars of sustainable finance was the ambition that we came up with at the time. Um, and that involved then how could we break that down? So what was the trajectory? What was the, you know, the products and services that we had available, how we saw that growing and where the growth lay and how we could then integrate that across the global businesses um, from large corporates to smaller corporates to, to you know, the, the personal clients as, and retail clients as well. So um, it started off with that, like I say, that long-term ambition and then finance were really supportive in doing some of those projections, doing some of the work around how that could pan out. Um, we've also been heavily involved in the, I guess, in the short term development of um, the reporting, the tracking, the monitoring, the coming up with the data dictionary as well. So maybe using more of a, a bit of a finance view in, of an audit per se, per kind of audit trail to think about, you know, if we're going to say this. And I think for us, we also made the decision to say, right, we're going to have our progress um, assured by our auditors so we took a decision to do limited assurance on our progress so again working closely to say these are our definitions this is our scope this is the activities we're going to do this is how we can put controls in place to make sure we don't greenwash which is one of the phrases that comes out a lot in a minute so if we see we know it's green we've said it's x amount we know it's x amount what checks and balances have we got in place to make that happen um, which is you know has been a, a challenge because if you look at a bank, you know, we provide a loan. A loan is a loan, depending sometimes if it's green, brown, or whichever color it may be. But um, ultimately, it's currently the same product within our system. So we've had to develop different ways of using that data, tracking, flagging, monitoring, and making sure we've got some, some governance in place around that. So yeah, finance has been key in, in setting those targets, uh, sorry, setting that ambition and the, the look forward look. We're also then involved in the scorecard process as well. So supporting the, the global businesses to say and the, the top of the bank to say, OK, if it's 100, what does that mean for this current financial year? How are we going to split that up between the regions, between the global businesses? Um, who's going to contribute to the key products and stuff? And as new products are developed, how does that fit in? So again, take an active role in um, uh, the monitoring and the judging of those scorecards to make it slightly financial and trying to think up some other metrics along the lines where we have areas of the business that don't have the same ability to contribute so some of it's been using the HSBC university training modules to say actually we've got seven dedicated modules on sustainability can you demonstrate that your team is understanding that by doing more training than the prior year so we it's a broader piece, so we'll do a lot of the monitoring, tracking and checking against that, um, but helping set the, you know, the scorecards and the targets. Um, and I guess that's regionally. The other key bit as a finance function we've been involved in is the TCFD disclosures, the five year roadmap, working with our risk functions to see what is our exposure to the six high risk categories working on then KPIs, meaningful KPIs and how they can then be embedded into the businesses so that we can make uh, better strategic decisions off the back of this information rather than producing information for information's sake it's how can we use that information to make better business decisions yeah so that sounds that's really useful to hear so you've used that term data dictionary a couple of times and uh, so just just to clarify that essentially is the way that you 
define everything that you're measuring as an organization how to measure it for, make sure that everybody is doing that in a consistent way yeah so for the for the hundred billion particularly so this is um yeah. we actually publish and i keep referring to the data do we have a document called our data dictionary so when we yeah. do our annual disclosure uh, disclosure it's in our annual report and accounts it's in our um annual esg uh, report again we publish then our data dictionary that clearly defines you know in this section it might be lending and in this lending section we have a green loan and a green loan means it's xyz and it aligns to the loan market association principles we've included it if it was from this date we include the limit so it clearly defines the parameters yeah. of how we would include it so um, it's so essentially again, the i guess the accounting standards and accounting policies for the sustainable finance within the bank yeah yeah, and yeah. yeah. so yeah that's okay. why we were involved in kind of I say we me writing a lot of that and kind of getting it um, sense checked and and like say signed off with our auditors as well. Yep, second nature for accountants. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, so um, so I guess in terms of that role of finance, then um, you know, and you've talked kind of about you know how you set these targets and how you embed those across the organisation. What about actually um, getting the concept of sustainability finance into those products and services? Um, you know, in terms of how you get people's buy-in and how you actually, you know, make it happen. Is there a role for finance within that? Um, yes, I mean, like I say, finance, we support the business lines across all the, the global functions as well. And so I think I've mentioned, you know, we, we looked at it in kind of scorecards, so in targets. So generally, if you target something, you get things tend to happen. Um, and as soon as we put some of these in the, the global scorecards of the regional heads, a lot more activity and interest got generated people were asking can this be included can that be included it's people started thinking differently around the types of things that can be included um, within that 100 billion um, but what we also do is um, every quarter i produce a, a finance a sustainable finance um, dashboard information pack which covers not just 100 billion because we realized that actually the 100 billion is not the full universe of sustainable finance products um, and services there's a lot more out there or things that are divine defined as within the umbrella of sustainable finance um, the hundred billion itself because of the data dictionary the checks that we have to make needs to be quite tight whereas there are other areas particularly around the esg space and, and a broader spectrum of investments where we might be using third-party funds or advice we're giving to clients which we can't always quantify or it isn't actually us providing capital which has been our focus so we we produce a suite of information so it tries to incorporate more than just the hundred it looks at like I say other products and services that we're doing so it encaptures more of those business lines um you know we're involved in a you know a number of areas the esg report we do is has historically been driven by the finance function we've incorporated a lot of the business lines there so even if it's not just sustainable finance esg is a broader concept which uh, this forms part of becomes more and more known within the organization um you know lots of learning like I say modules with our training functions um even within the finance function at Itself, we've done um, learning days on a number of topics which sustainability or sustainable finance has featured um, because it's having a much broader um, approach across the, the business um, and that type of thing so yeah, yeah. definitely a, a role for finance to play it sounds like training is a really useful way of getting people's buy-in as well and making sure that they understand why it's important yeah and and telling stories as well i think the the way we do a lot of it within the the organization with um with business the business lines as well is um you know giving examples of particular deals that we've done so once somebody in one country sees we've done this over here actually they start asking questions around how can that be done and what did the deal team look at we try to roll out a globally consistent um, process but again it it takes us telling stories and sometimes that involves finance and sometimes it's the business lines but actually we still need to know how we can track monitor and, and report across those things as well yeah great okay well we've had a few questions come in for part from participants and um, so um, I think we've got three questions at the moment so let's see if we can get through them quickly and um, so um, the first one is from Craig Oxby and um, Craig I don't know if you want to unmute and maybe ask your question yourself Hi there. Hi, John. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. So a, a question really around that you've talked a lot about the, you know, the positive steps you're taking, which is, is, uh, is great. Um, really my question is around how do you, how do you deal with the, the other side of it? Now I'm sure 
like any business, there's there's profitable returns in less sustainable uh, investments or otherwise. How, how have you dealt with maybe the ambitious, ambitions or pressures to reduce your activities or investments in less sustainable areas that would potentially give you a return? Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a challenging one. I mean, I guess we've been quite um, active in... Um, in um sorry my thing keeps beeping in um we've been active in um our coal policy so we've updated that over a number of years when we looked at how we would fund and, and not fund any new fossil fuels um if you look at our tcfd statement we've talked about our high transition risk sectors um and actually we haven't set overly ambitious targets to reduce those at the minute because what we're looking at is if there are clients that need to trans transition actually in the short term they might need a bit of extra help and they might need a little bit of extra funding to say can you transition and we'll give you a green loan or we'll help you to, um, to do that so it is a challenge um there are lots of parties that obviously will look at some of the, the browner area of our book and and say what are we doing in there so we are actively trying to to look at those high transition risk areas we've developed some questionnaires so that we can look at the strategies that the companies in those high risk areas are looking at and how they're looking to trans transform their businesses and, and if they can help and it might be there so there are some tricky conversations we might make some business decisions around um, what we will and won't do based on um, climate and other areas um, one of the things that is being talked about as well is um, green factors in terms of RWA so relief in giving us a additional capital for positive for green but also a negative penalizing factor for brown so again there's lots of work that you know that we're working with the regulators and and, and alike to say what are the things we should be doing what are the things we can be doing um but yeah there's no doubt that there is a, a big focus on that and you know it will take some time um, and particularly we have a diverse book across the um the globe and have some developing countries where uh, they're heavily reliant on a number of these um fossil fuel plants that might have just opened whereas we're trying to then see ways that we can help and move out um our view in the short term has definitely been if we were just to walk away somebody else would start lending and if we've walked away we can't have any positive influence and we can't help make that change if we don't have a seat at the table so um yeah it's a it's a challenging one and an interesting debate that we uh, we will continue to have no doubt thanks john Thank you. We've probably got time for just one more. So apologies that I won't get to ask everybody's questions. Um, but we just have one quick question here um, from um, Willem. Um, Willem, if you wanted to unmute and ask the question yourself, you're very welcome to. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. First of all, thanks, John, for this, uh, this uh, well, presentation. Um, you were referring to well, KP KPIs a couple of times. So can you give some specific examples of the KPIs that you are using internally to, let's say, measure uh, how good you are performing? Um, yes, I, I, like I say, there are, there are different um, areas that, that we look at. So we, we, we every quarter on our progress to the 100 billion um, in terms of how we're doing across the, the product lines, um, again, which goes into the scorecards every year. We look at um, the number of training modules that's been completed so how much additional staff have been looking at those we look at um, call reports where our rms or sorry our frontline bankers have recorded that they've had a conversation with the client and they've re mentioned sustainability as well so we're looking at the trend, how many more conversations are we having uh, we track some of the other um, things that might not be included in the 100 billion so that might be um, some of the like I say investment type products that we don't include some of the other activities for example we don't include um, mergers and acquisitions in our 100 billion but we still keep a track of track of those um, we keep a track of the um, and it might not necessarily be a KPI but the, the the exposure to the transition risk sectors so we, we look at those and say you know what are they doing currently can we see any trends what's any movements in those we're also trying to develop some more ESG type capability uh, sorry KPIs so again looks at you know client numbers cl customer complaints other internal metrics but from a sustainable finance it was the ones around performance training contact with customers they're the 
the main ones that we're uh, we're measuring at this moment. Thank you. Um, so, and thank you very much, John. That's been really insightful and really useful um, to hear everything that you're doing at HSBC. Um, so just to close out this session before we hear from um, our, our colleagues over at National Grid, and we just have um, a quick other a polling question. Um, so if I could ask my colleagues to, to pop that on the screen. So what are the key considerations when integrating sustainability into corporate strategy? Um, so you might remember this either from Elizabeth's presentation at the start or from anything you've heard from John. Just give you a moment or two. Okay. We can maybe pop the results on the screen. Fantastic. And again, I think they are all key considerations, uh, but obviously some have got slightly more prominence than others in your response. Okay, great. Um, so um, I'd like now to introduce um, our colleagues over from National Grid, um, Steve Thompson and Rob Gray. Um, as many of you may know, um, National Grid is an energy company operating both in the UK and the US. They own and operate the high voltage electricity transmission network in England and Wales and the high pressure gas transmission network across the UK. In the US, their gas and electricity businesses supply energy directly to customers. So we're pleased to have Steve Thompson, who is the environmental sustainability manager and Rob Gray, who is the finance business partner for electricity transmission. Um, and we're pleased to have them here to talk with us today about embedding carbon into decision making and doing that by using an internal carbon price in their investment budgeting. Um, so welcome Steve and welcome Rob. Hi. Hi. Um, so again, if you could put your questions in the chat function as we go, I'll do my best to get to as many of those at the end as we can. Um, so to start, um, Steve, um, National Grid plays a vital role in connecting low carbon generation to the UK transmission network. And this requires obviously a huge amount uh, of investment in new infrastructure to support the existing network. So maybe you could tell us um, when and why your company decided to implement in time internal carbon pricing um, in terms of that uh, meeting that challenge um, and how does it reflect the strategic priorities of the company? Sure, thanks Helen. Um, good afternoon everybody. Um, I'll start with the strategic priorities piece I think. So there's lots of similarities to, to what John has talked about for HSBC. Uh, as well. you know, what our company stands for, our approach to responsible business and, and getting sustainability at the heart of what we do. Um, our, our approach to responsible business, uh, res, res being a responsible business has five key areas. One of those is the environment. Um, and as you touched upon, given our role, it won't surprise you to know that um, that facilitation or to the low carbon, uh, the energy transition is absolutely core to what we do. Um, alongside that, we want to manage our own carbon footprint. And so um, since we're strategic priority, facilitating energy transition, but while doing that, hitting our own net zero goal for reducing our own emissions is, is absolutely key. Um, now, interestingly, as a regulated monopoly, kind of the way we use a carbon price is, is, is a little bit different, and we'll probably get onto that, um, in that quite often, we don't have a choice of whether we build new infrastructure or not. Our license dictates we have to build something. So really, it's about determining how we do that and what options we have. Um, also, as part of our, of our regulatory deal, we have some, some incentives that actually use the social cost of carbon to, to drive reduction in greenhouse gases to operate in our network. Um, but they cover a relatively small part of our carbon footprint. So what we identified was actually, you know, we've got a goal of, of, of reducing our own emissions. We want to manage the risk of being exposed to carbon price. And in some cases, that's a real cost to us because we've got those incentives. But how do we make sure that we are covering the entirety of our carbon footprint um, and that includes the operational emissions but also the emissions from our capital carbon um, as well so so um, we decided that using a, using a carbon price was was a way of doing that um, and so we're probably going back two or three years now where we decided that that's the approach we're going to take and 
we agreed a kind of a very high set of I'll call them rules that we were going to apply to our major investment decisions across our group, both UK and US. Major investment decisions, we would use a carbon price as part of the of the consideration, alongside all those other factors that, of course, any organisation takes into account when they're when they're making when they're making investment decisions. So that's kind of the, the backdrop of why we decided to use an internal carbon price. No, that's really useful. So I guess once you've kind of agreed that, you, that you're going to use it, um, you know, how do you actually apply that? You know, how does it actually fit in the OPEX and CAPEX process? You know, how do you go about determining the price? You, you, reckon, you, you reference that you already have sort of an external incentive. Um, but just thinking about how that fits into the budgeting process, I don't know whether... And that's one for you, one for Rob, or, or, or well, however you want to play it. But. Let, let, me, let me pick up how we came up with the price that we use, and then I'll let yep. Rob talk about how we actually use it. Um, okay, great. And, that, and, and I would say that was probably one of the most interesting debates that I've had in the sustainability space within the organisation. You know, because, um, as I say, we're, we, we're exposed to a price through some of our incentives, and that's a shadow cost of carbon or a social cost of carbon. We're exposed to some of the traded markets, so the EU emissions trading scheme. At the time we were setting the price, the price in that market was almost zero. So, um, and so, so, so we're exposed to that. Um, and we've also got different geographies. So the, the, the UK and the US at the time probably politically were in pretty different spaces in terms of their approach to, to low carbon. So, and then the other thing we wanted to, to take into account was it's got to be high enough to make a difference. And so, um, and so the reason I say that was really interesting is that it, you, know, you take an approach of doing an internal poll with right, who thinks, what do you think the carbon price should be? The range was just enormous. And so um, actually the, the, the request came back to me and my team and said, well, the sustainability team, come up with a price um, and then let, let's just go with it because you know, there isn't a right answer to this. So we landed on a price of $60 a tonne, it's about three years ago. And that was really to try and reflect all those different things that I've just, uh, just mentioned. But really, this was trying to just understand, is that the right price and will it make a difference? But let's just get going with, with, with that to start with. Great, thank you. And Rob, maybe you can elaborate on how that fits into the, into the budget pro budgeting process and, and investment decision making. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Graham, the ET Finance Business Partner, um, looking after transmission finance investments. Uh, sit on the committee that ultimately sanctions and makes decisions about what investment options we will take forward. Um, we do on a TOTEX, so OPEX and CAPEX basis, uh, so essentially on a cash flow basis. Now, in terms of how we embed the notional cost of carbon equivalent that Steve was just talking about, we have various checkpoints in our governance process. Now, at certain points in that process, we will test the notional cost of the option we are following so that we are always transparent, whether we're at the stage where we're early on scoping out an investment or whether we are detailed development or whether we are actually sanctioning to construct the chosen option. The, the key goal is transparency about the impact and the sustainability impact of the option we've chosen. So when we're cash budgeting, because there's not normally an incremental cash impact from the notional carbon cost that we're applying, apart from the specific greenhouse gas incentives that Steve mentioned, the actual cash cost doesn't factor into the tangible budgeting process because there isn't one, it's notional at the moment. So what we do is we make sure when we're doing net present value assessments, and doing discounted cash flows when we're comparing different options that we don't just say well this one's cheaper than that one so we will sanction that option we will also say this one is more expensive however the incremental cost of pursuing that option relative to the less sustainable option is x million pounds committee do you want to sanction the more sustainable option or do you want to sanction the cheaper option um, so what we have done is created a, a tool uh, which is essentially an estimating tool or built into the estimating tool which allows people to and I think this is really key quickly fetch the estimated carbon impact themselves 
rather than having a, a big cottage industry of, of manual effort every single time we need to do it. So when we're estimating the, the budgeted cost of a transmission asset, we will at the same time estimate automatically using this tool that the sustainability team have enabled the CO2 impact of it. Once we've calculated that, we will then state it at various checkpoints along the way. So when we're optioneering, um, doing the discounted cash flows, stated it as an intangible in that process. Uh, and then when we get to sanction in the business case papers that the committee uses to make a decision, they will say very clearly these papers, what is the tonnage of carbon dioxide equivalent that is resulting from this investment? Um, I think just the other thing to say on this is that we uh, require our contractors to be transparent about how they ultimately outturn in terms of the carbon impact. So what that will allow us to do in the business case is to say, well, when we agreed this option, we said it would be X hundred tons of CO2. How did it actually outturn? So we have checkpoints where we can compare it along the way. But in terms of capital allocation and prioritization, we have numerous stakeholders obviously to um, satisfy the requirements of. One of those is shareholders um, and one of those is bill payers. So there's this constant conflict, um, healthy conflict between the angle of, we need to minimize uh, bill payer impact to maximize shareholder value, but also consider our wider responsibility to um, society, communities. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of budgeting, that, that they're my views. Fantastic, thank you. I mean, what's great actually today about today is that we've got you know both of you here bringing both the finance and the sustainability um, perspectives. Um, and I think what's been really useful for people to hear is you know how have you actually worked together on this? How do you work together around internal carbon pricing? You know, what are the key aspects that you've had to collaborate on, and how has that helped you to overcome any challenges you've had along the way? Um, so from a from a sustainability perspective, I think uh, there, are, there are just two things, and, and, and Rob's touched upon one of them already. So the first is we involve finance right from the very start. So I, I think you've seen this quite 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 a, quite a lot where the default is because you're talking about carbon and climate change, you go to the sustainability team. That's where you start, and actually. Hopefully what we're seeing now is more, no, 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 it's the core business that needs to be involved in this. But that's where we're at the time. So we conversation with the finance business partners at the start. And actually it was it's quite interesting because the, the immediate feedback was, yeah, that's pretty straightforward, Steve. That's just pricing in an externality. We can do that. Oh, okay, right, okay, that's a great start. Um, and then the other bit is the, is the bit that Rob touched upon, he said, you know, use, use our existing processes. Um, and so we have, cost estimating tools aligned to specific assets that we use in our network. Let's ensure the carbon data aligns to those same assets in the same way so that when our finance people are getting the cost data, you get the carbon data at the same time. And I think one of the challenges is always, people understand obviously cost. The, the carbon data is less easy to understand to the kind of uninformed person. So, you know, is a thousand tons of carbon a lot or a little? Should I, be, should I be concerned about that or is that actually a small amount? So we try to make that easy as part of the process. Yeah. Have you um, on that, Rob, yet? Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, the working together part was um, the easy part for me. I think, um, you know, it was, it was good collaboration. Um, it was good, there were probably different points of view along the way, but it was healthy discussion all, all the time. Um, but I think, it's just the recognition that um, finance and sustainability are not uh, polar opposites. Um, you know, they both have the same ultimate goal, which is um, long-term value for society and long-term value for the business. So, I think there are common uh, common grounds um, that we that we touched on and made sure that was in focus when we we're working with the sustainability team. Great. And we've got a few questions coming in, so I'm just going to sort of cut short my final question maybe you could give me a fairly slick answer so we've got time to go to those questions um, um, and National Grid obviously you've made a commitment um, to net zero and I guess I just wanted to win, I just wanted to ask you know how crucial was having this carbon pricing mechanism to achieving that goal do you think? Um, I think 
the important bit for me is that it's the it's enabled us to assess carbon as part of our decision making. So in, in order to carbon price is just a, a way of assessing the carbon data. There are, there are a number of different ways you can do it. And actually, as part of our procurement um, tender process, we use a carbon weighting rather than the carbon price in some of those tenders because we found that works better. So I think that why it's been important is, is it's in order to achieve what we've achieved, we've had to measure carbon, we've had to build a carbon database, and now we've got a much greater understanding across the organisation of where is the carbon, where are those carbon hotspots, and where should we focus our efforts. Um, I think that's as important as then whether you use a carbon price or another tool in order to incorporate the carbon into the decision making. Great, thank you. Um, so um, we've got a question here from Francesca. Um, Francesca, do feel free to unmute and ask that question yourself. Yeah, so I was just wondering regarding the internal carbon price and the estimation tool that you're referring to, like who in the business is able to use that? And whether there were any um, sort of, I suppose, additional requirements needed from those teams in terms of getting the base data that you needed to be able to calculate the carbon and if you had any issues sort of onboarding people with that. So I, I'll cover the teams that use it, uh, primarily investment engineers. So they are the engineers that are pricing up the costs of the proposed option. Um, now, it was bolted onto an existing tool to some degree, so Steve will probably have to talk about some of the detail in terms of how difficult that was, because um, from my point of view, it, it kind of happened after a few weeks after we asked for it, and I was surprised how little time it took. Um, but the great thing is it's a self-serve uh, approach, which means that the people that are already costing up from a budgeting perspective, how much will this asset cost us to build, are using the same kind of process at the same time, able to, on a kind of shopping list drop-down basis, for that asset, get the carbon impact of it. So anything you want to add to that, Steve? Yeah, um, it wasn't quite as straightforward as a few weeks. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah there, was, there was a bit of effort in building up the carbon database. You know, there are lots of externally available carbon data sources that you can use. But at least the challenge that we had was we wanted to align it to the specific assets we use on our network. And as a transmission network owner, lots of those assets are really specific to us. And so the work was involving how do we take that raw carbon data and turn it into something that works within national grid. So that, that was where the effort was, but that's the point I was trying to make. But once you've done that and you've got that database, that can be utilized you know, right, across our, right across our business. Fantastic. So thank you both. That's been really insightful and really, really helpful. Um, I just want to ask of everybody just a couple more poll questions to close out the webinar um, today. Um, so maybe my colleagues can pop on the screen. Great. Um, so um, just checking you've, uh, you've, you've listened today. Um, what are the key attributes of shadow pricing? Again, that might be from something Elizabeth said at the start of the webinar, or maybe it's something you've heard from Steve and Rob. I'll just give you a few seconds to respond. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. So the, the most popular one then there seems to be around driving cultural change, which I do think believe is absolutely true and consistent with what we've heard today. Um, so um, thank you very much, everybody, for taking part. Um, if you've attended these webinars before, um, you may know that we do like to ask you a question towards the end, um, just to get a sense of what you might do differently um, after the end of this webinar, based on what you've heard. Um, so here we go. How will you translate what you have learned in this workshop to your work in the next six months? Um, please feel free to pick, tick as many as are relevant to you. See those coming in now, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so I will just hand it over to Lizzie to just take us through um, the wrap up. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much, Helen, um, and thank you, everybody. Um, so just to say that we will be sending some further resources uh, following this webinar, um, which are a mix of explore, read, watch, listen. It will include some of the content that we have discussed today already, as well as some other useful links. Um, please feel free to pass this on to your colleagues. There's lots of interesting information that I'm sure they will find useful too. So the next workshop in our series will be Measure What Matters, uh, where we will be looking at natural and social capital accounting. This will take place on the 13th of August at 4 p.m. British Summer Time, same as this webinar. Um, for those of you who are accounting or finance professionals, you might wish to consider applying for the A4S Academy. Uh, details of this will be included in the follow-up email. Um, so I'm just going to see if there's any more questions, if anyone would like to put anything in the chat or just come off mute and ask any questions. Just give me a minute or so for that. No, okay, um, great. So as I say, we are running several more webinars over the coming months. Um, so in order to help us make these as useful as possible, um, please may I ask that you complete this very short uh, feedback poll before you sign off. I will just leave this up and running here. And all that is left is for me to say thank you so much to our speakers and to thank you all for joining. And uh, I hope you have a very good rest of the afternoon.